yes we uh cool all right one two three four okay all righty and then i'll i'll just record an intro and yeah introduce you once i figure that out so happy to be here with randall clark the music well what's your official title here at corner canyon i'm the director of instrumental music at corner canyon high school that's awesome how long how long have you been at corner canyon i've been at corner canyon since we opened and i'm guessing what has that been seven eight years yeah and this is my 25th year teaching really yeah where else have you taught I taught at Jordan High School for about 14 years, and then I taught two years at Joel P. Jensen Middle School. What is it about teaching that kind of draws you in and keeps you going? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's it, it's fun to, you know, start something with, with kids, especially this age group I, I particularly like, and watch them you know, grow it into something that you wouldn't expect could have been possible when it started. That's kind of fun for me. Did you play? I, I saw that you, I, I read up a little bit on you. I know, first off, Randall and I go back a little bit. We used to be in the same neighborhood many moons ago in Harriman. And, uh, or is that supposed to be off the record? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. We'll edit that part out. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Randall and I know each other for going back a few years and, uh, I read up on you, though, and, and saw that you started playing saxophone at age nine. Is that correct? Yeah, so elementary school band was really big when I was, uh, when I was really young. And there aren't as many uh, elementary school programs like there used to be. It used to just be a thing. Um, in fact, they had elementary school band teachers that would go around to every elementary school during the school day. So you'd get out of your normal elementary school class for an hour to go do elementary school band. And that started in the fourth grade. And, and I believe if you were a string player, you could do it as early as third grade. Mm. So, but that was cool. So instead of having to do it before or after school, all the other kids were doing uh, nutrition or, or extra work on something else. And we were all going <laughs> to band, you know, for an hour with the elementary school band teachers. So, And then you pick saxophone. I pick saxophone. I think my dad... Uh, would have preferred something different, uh, but my mom liked saxophone. She grew up listening to like Dave Brubeck and uh, you know music of that um, of that kind, and so there were some records laying around of saxophonists. And I remember listening to Paul Desmond early on, and uh, really thought that was I, I liked the sound of that. I really liked it a lot. And so yeah, so that's where I went. Yeah, I remember when I was in the fourth grade, did the same thing with elementary. They they let you out, and I picked the drums because you know the drummers are the coolest. I mean, sax saxophone players are pretty cool too, but then they're like, okay, you hold the drumsticks like this. I'm like, no, that's not how you. It just seemed so weird. I ended up playing the cello, so yeah, <laughs> which choice. I love. Yeah, it was a great choice. Uh, so you you start playing with your elementary, and then how did your music career progress from there? Um, I. When I got to junior high, uh, I mean, junior high band was a pretty big deal back then, too, like, especially in the area that I grew up in. And so you kind of had to get lessons if you wanted to compete with the other um, with, with the peers that, that you had. Everybody was taking lessons. Everybody was getting really good. And so uh, I realized that real quick after my seventh grade year. So I got some saxophone lessons and. I had a really great teacher that taught me how to do jazz improvisation. I was doing this in the eighth grade. And ever since then, uh, it was just, you know, one opportunity after another. And, and that's kind of how it is, you know, when you, when you start doing something, it, whatever that is, taking lessons or putting in extra practice time or whatever, um, you start being capable of more. And when you are capable of more, more opportunities start coming your way. So I, uh, by, 10th grade, I was playing in the All-State Jazz Band. I did that all three years of high school. I um, had a full-ride scholarship to college on saxophone. Mm. Um, you know, it, it was just something that spoke to me. And and I, because of that, I spent a lot of time working on it, you know, so. Saxophone, it, it seems like that's one of those, you, you talked about improv. That's, it seems like one of the instruments where you really thrive on improv. It, is that... Correct, or is that a good analysis? Well, or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I part of it is, is kind of hearing in your head what you want, and 
that's partly from listening so much to other saxophone players and not not just saxophone but other jazz musicians that that do that you start hearing certain things over and over and you learn what that's supposed to sound like and then you figure out how to play it and that's really what jazz improv is you're actually not just pulling stuff out of out of the air magically you know you're it's it's sort of like speaking a different language and you know when you're in another country and you don't know the language over time you start hearing certain phrases and um, inflections and things like that that are common uh, for wherever you are and the more you hear those the more they kind of just get into your uh, in, into your head and you're able to start you know producing those and then uh, you know on top of that of course you know there's the practicing scales and arpeggios and all that stuff too but that just makes you more more fluent but really that's what it is is just listening so much to other players that you want to sound like and the improv just kind of comes from that that point you know yeah so you said you got a full ride scholarship to uh for music and at I what did. point at yeah. what point did you which school and and was it then that you decided i want to make this my career yeah so my junior high band director was one of these really impressive people and, and also a very good band director. And I remember liking him so much, even at, in eighth grade, I was thinking like, man, maybe, maybe I'd like to teach band one day. You know, I wasn't thinking about having a professional career as a saxophone player. I just wanted to teach band and be like my junior high band director. And then I had a really great high school experience too. And my band director in high school was really cool. And so when I got to college, I, it just, that was just the natural thing to do was to uh, do music education. And so I did. And two years into it, I had, I became sure that I was doing the wrong thing. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you, you, people always hear the stories like, well, if you're in music, you know, you're not going to be able to make a lot of money. And um, if, you know, music education, well, there's only so many band jobs around, you know, so you start he hearing all these things that kind of discourage you from wanting to do it. So I think well, maybe I'll go into computer programming instead. Um, but um, after spending two years, I decided that, you know, it isn't worth stopping and switching. I'll just stay and, and do this and finish it. And then if I don't like it, I'll do something else later. You know, at least I'll have the degree. So, yeah, so I went into music ed and, and uh, got my first job at Joel P. Jensen Middle School. And after that first year of teaching, I was sure I didn't want to teach band. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was really challenging, uh, you know, teaching middle school students that first year for me. I, some people probably take right to it, but I, I struggled a little bit and uh, went actually that summer looking for other jobs. But I, I, I really couldn't find anything that was going to work for me job wise. And I'm like, well, I'll, I'll give I'll give it another year and see how it goes. And the second year I taught middle school was probably the best year that I've had teach. One of the best that I've had teaching. I loved it. It went from literally the worst year ever to the best year. And at that point, it was like, yeah, I think this is this is for me. And it's just been that way ever since. What caused the the transition or the change? I don't know. <laughs> I just yeah, it clicked. I, I maybe I maybe I just got better at the job. I got better <laughs> at dealing with the the younger kids maybe the kids just got better maybe I don't know. <laughs> so. well that's that's great so the clicks and you start you start progressing along that teaching career at what point did did your professional musician career take off so throughout that whole time um you know the, the school uh, money you know wasn't quite an, as much as i hoped it was and i needed something to supplement that with and so I would play uh, jobs on the side, you know, as, as a lot of musicians do. They go and they play at weddings or um, at, a, at a club or something at night. And, you know, and you, you walk home at that time, you know, with like 75 or 100 bucks, which was pretty, pretty cool. You go spend a night, you make 100 bucks. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, so I was doing that a couple times a week, and that was helping to supplement things. But also I had a lot of friendships that were made um, in college and, and even in high school before that. And all of these friendships were people that played music. And so they're always looking for a sax player. They might be looking for a bass player. You know, so you, the people you know are the people that you call. And so I just continually would, would work because of the, the friends that I had. And, you know, and so that was nice because it isn't just going out and working and playing music. You're also you're going out and hanging out with your friends and you're playing music, which is really cool. 
So, so I've, I'd been doing that ever since. And I, at one point in time, I, I thought, man, I, I really would like to make an album. Yeah. You know, one day I'd like to do that. And even in, in high school, I was recording in my basement and making these kind of fake records. I mean, I guess they were real records, but they were all produced by, by me. And I remember playing my saxophone into a tape deck and then I'd record piano into a tape deck and then I'd record the piano uh, recording into another tape deck like because I didn't have a multi-track recorder. So I was just figuring out how to, you know, shoestring the the whole process together to make a record. And I thought that was really, really fun. And so I'd make these little tapes and I'd hand them out to my friends and stuff like that. And they weren't very good. Um, <laughs> But uh, but I, I've always kind of had that in the back of my mind of something that I, I wanted to do. And then, you know, teaching is such a demanding and time-consuming job. I just have never had time to do it. And so it was, you know, 20, over 20 years before I really said, you know what, if I'm, if I'm ever going to do this, I need to do it now. Because, you know, time's running out to really, you know, make, make a good go of, of this. So... Uh, so that's what I did. And I actually, I, I have, a, again, it's, it's who, you know, is so important and making friendships with people. And, and as they say, you know, you know, be a cool person because the cooler person you are, you know, the more people, um, are going to be around you who like you and, and you never know which of those people are going to have a connection here or a connection there. And, um, one of my friends that I, uh, had, had a connection with a very, famous bassist. His name's Jimmy Haslip. And uh, Jimmy Haslip was the bass player and founding member of a really famous uh, jazz group called the Yellow Jackets. And if, if you're into jazz, you probably know who they are. And if you're not, maybe you don't. But, but in terms of jazz, I mean, Jimmy Haslip is about as big a name as they get. Well, he was friends with, uh, with Jimmy and put me in touch with with him and I sent Jimmy just a little sample of me playing and he said yeah I'd love to work with you and and from there I got to use all of his connections you know so he brought in probably the most famous contemporary jazz keyboardist named Jeff Lorber Grammy winning uh, composer and keyboardist and and he brought him in to help me write some songs and and to collaborate with you know in, in, the, in the band as a pianist and and other people, I got to play on the record, um, like Sonny Emery from Earth, Wind & Fire. He's the drummer. Huh. Um, this uh, really famous trumpeter, Randy Brecker. So just basically by utilizing these connections that I got through my friend, I was able to not just make a record, which I could have just done. I could have just made a record by myself, and, and it probably would have been fine, and I would have fulfilled my goal. But because of this connection, I was able to make this record with really famous and outstanding people, uh, which was just so much fun because, you know, you, you'd have to sit there sometimes and just be like, is this really happening? Am I, <laughs> am I recording a record with Randy Brecker and Jimmy Haslip and, you know, and these guys? And yeah. And, and it was also great to have them because they're so good at making records. Um, obviously, you know, Grammy, Grammy winning, you know, musicians, they're, they're good at, at this. The final product ended up being, you know, probably ten times better than what I had expected it, it would ever be. That's awesome. But yeah, I tuned into Spotify last night. I listened to New Day, I believe is it's called, and I was fantastic. It's really, really good. And you have the experience that you tuned into the radio, and all of a sudden you're hearing yourself play on on the radio. That must have been pretty awesome. Yeah, and in the genre I'm in, you know, in the jazz and specifically contemporary jazz, there aren't as many radio stations as there used to be. You know, times are changing. Like you said, you you logged into Spotify and that's where most people are getting their music is online streaming, you know, YouTube or Apple Music or something like that. But around the country, there still are radio stations that people listen to in, in different places. There's one in Las Vegas, but I think we're down to about 15 or so radio stations that that play contemporary jazz and uh so i i was able yeah to get one of the, actually I had two tracks now on the radio um and what you hope is that you get on xm oh, okay. satellite radio that's the that's the one you want to get on and i was lucky enough to get both of uh the two singles that i put out on xm radio and i don't actually even subscribe to xm radio but i bought my wife a new car and you know they come with it yeah. nice <laughs> you, you, get, you get it for a month or whatever 
Um, Speaking of your wife, and also an accomplished musician. She is. She's Lori. a French she's... horn player. Uh, she plays down in the orchestra at Temple Square. Yeah, um, she's fantastic. Yeah, I a real musical family. All my kids play. Um, I got two trumpet players and two saxophone players and a flute uh, flutist. And all five of my kids were able to play on the record in the horn section too, which is oh, that's is really neat. Cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Where did you record the album? So, I think what most people think happens when you record a record is you rent a studio and everybody gets together and you go down there and, and you record all together and and that certainly is one way to do it and people do do that. Um, however, this all happened during the pandemic and nobody was getting together and so I never had the experience of getting everybody together all at one time, uh, which in some ways was a blessing because I was able to get so many different, you know, uh, famous people on the record where otherwise I would have only maybe been able to do a couple people because you know, you're getting all together. But what I do is I would, I just, we'd get the arrangement and the tracks all made and, and then we'd, we'd send the samples out to the drummer and the drummer would just play his drums on top of whatever you sent them and now you've got Sonny Emery playing drums or uh, we'd send it to the bass player and the bass player would just replace what bass is on the sample track with their bass and then it would come back to me and I'd lay my saxophone on it at, uh, at home by myself and then you know you send it out to a mixing engineer that you can put it all together and you know it's, it's, it's a really interesting and sometimes complex process to do it that way but um, but it was just great because I was able to use so many people that I wouldn't have been able to use. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. That so, uh, where where can people get the 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 record? So, well, you can buy it. Uh, you you can buy them on iTunes if you want to just get normal uh, like single tracks, or you can buy them. I have a website too. Is, you know, this is what I do on the side now. I yeah, that's. <laughs> I'm a jazz musician on the side <laughs> selling records. So. Yeah, my my uh, website randallclarkmusic.com. Um, also, uh, you know, you can stream it everywhere, and that's that's kind of cool. So you don't that's even really have cool. to buy. You, you know, in fact, people just buy I think records now and CDs. Just you know, it's like souvenirs. They're not <laughs> nobody nobody knows what to even do with them anymore. Yeah, you know? they. Uh, I know you're you uh, received an award earlier this year, the Salt Lake City. Uh, jazz player of the week or something to that effect yeah there's a there's an organization salt lake city jazz and they uh recognized me as the uh, salt lake jazz artist of the week that that was fun um had some uh music education awards in the past as well I, i'm a sorensen legacy award winner from 2014 and uh utah music educators association uh, outstanding high school director so there have been a few honors that have come my way i'm humbled and honored by and those have been fun so. that's fantastic and, and your record's getting some really rave reviews as well I, i've seen out there that that must be really gratifying yeah, yeah I, I i hope so there have been a, a few good reviews it's uh it was submitted for a grammy i saw yeah. that that's, that's really exciting <laughs> yeah i mean those are super hard to come by um they've also condensed the categories now so there used to be a, a category for contemporary jazz and now they've basically wrapped everything if it's instrumental They've wrapped it, basically everything into one category for instrumental. So I'm going up against uh, artists that aren't even jazz musicians now. So it's, it's a lot harder to win a Grammy. And there's, of, of course, I don't expect that or, or even a nomination. But, but it was cool that someone thought high enough of the record to submit it. So. so I used to cover the Utah Jazz for the Deseret News as a sports writer before getting this job at the district. And when I'd go to New Orleans, where the jazz originated, New Orleans Jazz, the some of the fans would start chanting there ain't no jazz in utah they're really upset that the jazz took the name to utah with them so they want to be the new orleans jazz and they're there's no jazz in utah <laughs> which was a pretty funny line but is what, what's the state of jazz and we're not talking about donovan mitchell and rudy gobert but the state of jazz yeah. in utah we we have a pretty strong jazz scene in utah actually so um, we don't have a lot of venues like where people go to hear jazz, but there are two or three and the musicians that are here um, are very strong. And as a matter of fact, a lot of uh, I had a couple musicians locally that I used on the record just because they're they're so strong. Um, but uh, yeah, it's alive and well and and 
the jazz education world is extremely strong here in Utah, uh, too, you know, with the thanks of like Brigham Young University and the U of U and some other colleges around, you know, really, you know, waving the flag for that. Um, but uh, if, if you want to be a jazz musician, this is a great place to live and work and a great place to learn jazz. So just, just about as good as anywhere, I, I would say, with the exception of, you know, uh, we have fewer places that you can actually go listen to it on like a, like a nightly basis. But yeah, there's also quite a few, it seems like there's quite a few jazz bands in in the high school arena. Is that, yeah. Is so that growing or is it kind of just some schools have it and some don't? Or? It's holding steady. I think almost every high school probably has one. Uh, most junior high, well, maybe not most, but I'd say probably half of our middle schools in the state have one. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of great music educators in the state that are um, doing a great job, uh, you know, promoting that art form. It, it's, it's a different thing. It's, you know, it's not pet band. It's not concert band. It's, it's its own thing with its own distinct language and its own history that is fascinating to learn about and, and perform. Are you a Utah jazz fan? Of they, course. <laughs> <laughs> right answer. Yeah. Uh, so what's the future look like for you? I, 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 you're a busy man. You, you said you have five kids and yep. you're, you know, music director at high school and yep. got your own record. Yeah. Well, the, the primarily, you know, it's holding steady, you know, with the music ed thing and teaching here at the high school and hopefully, you know, making the students that I have under, you know, under my care, you know, as good as they can, they, they can be. I, I, it, it gives me a lot of pleasure to watch these kids, um, get better and better and some of them move on into college with scholarships and then even beyond that professionally i've had many who have um so that that's been great um i, I am going to keep working I, i'm starting a new record as we speak but you know it kind of it simmers on the back seat uh, but now i have the right people around me because of those connections it, it makes it a lot easier uh, to do that stuff um, does make it hard to be a, a touring musician. I don't know if that's something I really want to do anyway. I don't, you know, I did just play at the Catalina Island Jazz Festival though this last uh, weekend, which was a lot of fun. So, you know, occasionally traveling around and performing with some cool people is is awesome. But, you know, making making another record and and teaching band at the high school, you know, that's where it's at. So, is it the Cannonballs? Is that the? Uh, well, so. There's, I, there's an, another group that I play with called the Cannonball Band. Oh, the Cannonball yeah, Band, so there's, okay. There's the Cannonball Band, and that's been fun because they bring in uh, uh, some cool artists to perform with us. Um, and uh, it's there, there's a company that makes saxophones called Cannonball, and they put together a little band, and I, I'm associated with Cannonball as well. It's another thing I do on the side. Is I, I I work with Cannonball, um, helping them with their saxophones, and uh, they get a band together and they bring in some of the fancy artists that play the instrument, and we do some videos that go up on YouTube where you can hear them play, and and I get to play with them and things like. So that's been really fun. That's been more of a marketing thing for um, for for the company, uh, but for me personally, uh, it's you know playing jazz festivals and stuff around around the country uh, with my own group. Uh, you know, not not the Cannonball Band, but the own my own Randall Clark Band. <laughs> Is that what it's called, the Randall Clark Clark Band? I haven't given it a name. Oh, okay. That's as good as any, so. <laughs> yeah, it has a nice ring to it. So you you're talking about teaching. It, some NBA players or athletes or other people in their professions who are the top of their line, which you are. I mean, you you're one of the the best saxophone players in Utah and and the nation. What is it difficult? to teach players who aren't as good as you and it, it, is it hard to be patient with them and do you do you have to kind of put earplugs in sometimes <laughs> uh, i've never put earplugs in yet but definitely there are sounds you hear sometimes that are that are tough to hear um but no it never it you know everybody's different not everybody is meant to be a, a basketball player but it doesn't mean they shouldn't play basketball and not everybody's meant to be a professional musician but it doesn't mean they shouldn't have a music experience, you know? Um, and so th the kids that, you know, show potential for, for being that way are, are fun and exciting and that's great. Um, but primarily, 
I, I always just have to tell myself, you know, my job isn't to make professional musicians. My job is to give everybody as high uh, quality music uh, experience as I can. And they're just going to bring to the table what their own uh, talent and their uh, hard work, you know, what, what, what they bring with them. You know what I mean? So um, what they end up being is completely up to them. And, uh, of course, you know, being the head of the program here, you know, we want everything still to sound good. So, you know, it's not like we just say, you know, you're okay and, and that's all right. No, if you're going to be here, you're going to be great, you know, no matter what. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to break my back making sure that you're great. But even those kids, you can make them sound great, but it doesn't mean that they're going to be able to exist at that top level, you know, later on. And that's totally okay. So. What, would, what is your pitch to high school students or middle school students about learning an instrument or playing in a band or an orchestra? What, why is music important, do you think, to the youth? So music, specifically, and, I, and I, you know, singing in a choir or singing in a, or, or playing an instrument in a, in a concert band or a jazz band, uh, I think they're really, it's really important to be involved in something like that for a couple reasons. One is that, like I said, you make associations with people that you are not likely to make, you know, like in your history class. You know, you might know the person next to you or something like that, but in general, they're just passing people in your life. Um, when you play in a band, even a big concert band, these are people that you hang out with more often than usual. Um, you're, you're hanging out in small groups, you're having socials, you're, you're, you're involved in a group project that culminates into hopefully something amazing. And that experience brings people together, right? So there's something that's really important, you know, just from a social aspect. Um, but also, you know, playing music is hard. And it isn't, so, we don't tell people that, you know, like, like, hey, everybody, welcome to band today. This is hard. Um, but it is because, you know, if you, uh, you know, take a math test and, you know, you miss out of 100 questions, you miss 10 questions, you know, uh, you still have an A, right? In band, if you got 100 notes and you miss 10 of them and you're in a group, where everybody else is missing 10 others at the same time, where individually everyone in the room might be getting an A, the overall product is terrible. You know what I mean? And so it's very difficult, number one, to uh, play your own part at an A level, but then to have everybody else, you know, like you really can't afford to, to, play mis to have mistakes if you want to have the overall product be an A. Um, so in that regard, band is extremely difficult. Choir is difficult. Orchestra it's difficult because the, the level at which you have to perform is so high. The stakes are so high. Um, so with those two things together, you know, the, the you know, friendships you make and then the, just the, the demand to be excellent all the time, you know, not unlike a, a sports team, you know, uh, that is extremely satisfying and it's extremely, um, I think, helpful to teenagers, you know. Um, they're they're going to learn about hard work. They're going to learn how to, how to be cool with people, you know, and that kind of thing. So, and the side benefit is they learn some really cool music along the way. I could go on. I have all sorts of questions, but we had limited time, but... Awesome, man. That how many how many instruments do you actually play? Uh, I play saxophone, flute, clarinet, a little violin, and piano. I can play the others, but you wouldn't want to hear it. <laughs> That's how I am with the uh, the or the cello now. Unfortunately, started trying the ukulele. That was kind of fun. So, <laughs> all right, Randall. Thank you so much, and uh, we should wish you the best, and appreciate you. your time. Yeah.